Good afternoon. We are very glad that you have joined us for this panel discussion. It's titled Tragedy at Santa Fe High School Lessons Learned. And you're going to have the opportunity to hear from some Santa Fe ISD leaders, the superintendent of schools, Dr. Lee Wall, the president of the board of trustees, Mr. Rusty Newman, and the assistant Norman, sorry, I actually have known you for a long time, sorry about that, and the Assistant Police Chief, Gary Forward. And then we're going to be leaving about 15 minutes at the end for questions. First, I want to share with my esteemed panelists, Dr. Wall, uh, uh, President Norman, and, and Chief Forward, uh, on behalf of all of those who are in the audience, I want to thank you for agreeing to serve on this panel. Certainly, it is not easy for you to relive such an experience as the terrible tragedy that occurred in your district. First, I want to acknowledge that the act of violence on May 18th at Santa Fe High School, I know that it tragically changed your community, and it changed your community forever. And we want to, as a group here, express our sorrow and our support for all the families who lost loved ones, for those students and staff members who were injured and for their families, and certainly for the entire community. I was very honored to ask to moderate this panel because I have had the opportunity to work closely with the Santa Fe ISD School District for a long time. My team at Region 4 Education Service Center and I um, are honored to be able to support them, and we certainly have worked very extensively with them since this tragedy. Dr. Wall, I know that having been with you and your team both during the response and also during the recovery, that your focus, all three of you, <clears throat> and all of the team members that you represent, your, uh, in, your purpose is to enhance the safety in your school district, to provide support for the mental health and the emotional needs of your students and staff, all the while giving your teachers those tools and the support that they need to provide a quality education for the children in Santa Fe ISD. So to begin, Dr. Wall, would you please help to provide a context for us? Please describe the Santa Fe ISD school district and community and tell us why you and your colleagues are here presenting today. Thank you, thank you for the kind words as well. So Santa Fe ISD is located in Galveston County and that is between Houston and Galveston. It's a rural community. We have 4,800 students and about 650 staff, and our, um, it's, it's a very close community and a very strong community. So one of the reasons that we, we are all here today is to hope to share some experiences and opportunities for others that may be in um, situations and to learn from the experiences that we have had in the past and to hopefully prevent other opportunities for um, violence and and the hor horrific violence that, that seems to be an epidemic in our country and, and certainly something that we don't want in our school. So our hope is to be able to share and um, help move forward in other circumstances as well. So in our district, one, I, I would like to just share with you something that, that we'll begin with our mission statement. Our mission statement in our district is to prepare all of our students and staff members to achieve and succeed. And, and when, when I think of preparing, we'll, we'll talk, I think, a little bit about um, our preparations for any type of crisis and the importance of that. And, and then another context of our mission statement involves the importance of collaborative relationships, and that also is key in our learnings in, in regards to this, this event and this tragedy. So I wanna, I wanna say that because it, it, it fits very well, obviously in the context of teaching and learning and educating children, but, uh, but also very importantly in responding and preparing for um, crisis, crisis events. So in our district, safety, and that's, that's um, our topic today, safety's always been a priority. And I think you'll, you'll hear a little bit about how we have in the past uh, prepared for for events and crises and then and then uh, obviously after our tragedy at our high school So I'll kind of leave it there to go forward. So, Thank you for having us though So President Norman you have a different perspective a very important perspective as president of the Board of Trustees What would you like to add? So first Pam again, thank you all for the opportunity um, This is obviously a subject that no one ever wants to talk about or 
one has the need to talk about, but it's an unfortunate reality in this society today. Um, one thing I'd like to add is the, the Santa Fe community and the Santa Fe School District has now joined a very small group that no one wants to belong to. And we were fortunate early on to be able to make contact with some folks from other school districts that had experienced this. And again, that list is very small and no one wants to belong to it, but we now do. So we, we got some, some interesting perspective from those folks early on with uh, thoughts of how the community and the students themselves and our own teachers and all may respond. So we were very appreciative for that. Um, I will also tell you that Santa Fe ISD had everything in place, our crisis management plans, the mitigation plans, all our, our response to a crisis in, in recovery. And I can tell you, Santa Fe ISD was as prepared as we could be, but yet we still had that event on May the 18th. So <clears throat> I know that those of you in the audience who are educators are aware that all schools in Texas are required to have a multi-hazard crisis management plan. And those plans have to include a focus on the different phases of dealing with a crisis, um, mitigation and preparedness, a response to a crisis, and recovery. And so we're going to have our conversation today around those phases to try to help uh, with those lessons learned. And I would like to add um, to what you said, Rusty, I know based on my own observations, also based on data, that their, uh, Santa Fe ISD was as prepared for this as any school district that I know, yet it still happened, as you said. So we're hoping today we'll end up helping uh, other school districts as they uh, deal with this. So, Dr. Wall, uh, not only did you have to deal with, with this horrible tragedy uh, at your high school, but 17-18 was not a very good school year for Santa Fe or for many of the school districts in the region um, because we started with Hurricane Harvey at the beginning of the school year and then you ended with this tragedy. So, would you please share um, how your plan, your district crisis plan was implemented, and then what kind of changes had you refined even prior to this event? Sure, so you're absolutely right. It was a very difficult year in our school district and our community. We began the year uh, week into school with Hurricane Harvey that displaced thousands of our families. In our plan, so we have a multi-hazard crisis plan includes other, um, other things and shootings, and um, hurricanes are, are, are in that mix as well, and we, we had prepared according to our plan, and in that scenario, our district fared very well, our community did not. However, our plan was activated in support of the community. We, our buses were deployed to help evacuation, our police officers helped run a shelter, our child nutrition and um, staff helped also with that shelter, and we sheltered um, families until they could find uh, housing, and so, our school was closed for 10 days because people couldn't get in, couldn't get into their homes and, um, and there was a lot of uh, rebuilding and recovery at that time. And, and to some degree, there still is. And then at the end of the year, of course, uh, a mass casualty tragedy of violence happened. And again, our plan in a different way was, um, was tested. So I will tell you, and I, and I know that um, Chief Forward will talk about some details, but in a crisis plan, you, you have characteristics of mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. So we initially, on May 18th, that plan went into effect immediately. So with the things that we had in place in terms of response, um, where the Joint Information Center would go, the media response, the reunification center, um, all of our staff acted according to the plan. They knew exactly where to go and what to do. Some of that plan, plan is a living document, and, and we learn based on our experiences and then on others' experiences, which is why we're here. We, uh, we learned from um, Parkland folks. We learned from Columbine folks, things that, that we learned to include in our plan. For example, 
Um, our Joint Information Center was located off-site, away from the high schools. It was at our Agriculture Center, and it was done that way on purpose, because, and it worked out really well, <clears throat> because when the event happened, um, you couldn't get close to the high school. It, it was gridlocked. There were, there were so many response vehicles. So that Joint Information Command Center located off-site allowed for media and the press conferences and things that had to happen um, in, a, in an area that wasn't close to the school. So that worked out really well. That was according to plan. Our reunification center went, was designed in a place, and, and all of that went according to plan. I will tell you that, that one of the things that we did not have as well anticipated, and I'm not really sure that you could, is the emotional response for our reunification and recovery piece is you know, our people knew where to go and what to do in that reunification plan, but what we didn't account for is how strongly they would be impacted personally. So I mentioned we were a smaller community. Many of our staff who responded and were assigned to that reunification center had family that were at the high school. They were, they were mothers, brothers, children, um, and, and grandchildren, and they were emotionally impacted as well. And so for them to operate and to manage logistics and the details around a reunification center was very difficult. So that, of course, would be an area that in the future when we are tweaking our plan that we would change so that our folks are able to um, recover as well as respond. So, um, so our plan in regards to what we had in place worked very, very well to that point. Um, as as um, Rusty said, although we were prepared to manage a crisis, we were not at all prepared for the emotional uh, piece, the recovery piece, and many of those pieces that we will um, continue to add to our plan, especially in the area of recovery, because that's something that we, we had no idea um, how it would impact us all community and our staff and families. So that's certainly we've learned, and, and we'll hopefully talk through some of those today, we've learned a lot in that process. But as, as prepared as we were, I think there's an area that you can't, can't be prepared for, and certainly that's the reality and the emotional impact of such an event. So uh, Chief, uh, mitigation and preparedness are clearly critical phases. Um, and so would you please describe uh, what um, you and, and the rest of the um, police department and the school district had done prior to May 18th? And then would you please share with us some examples of some things that you have decided to change as a result of May 18th? Sure. We worked very closely with the school and have for years um, in, in coming up with this crisis management plan, planning for different events as best we could, like's already been said. We thought we were very, very well prepared for whatever came our way. Um, and, the, and the plan worked as, as well as it was going to work. Um, we tend to learn lessons from other, from other places that they also thought that they were very well prepared. Um, there's always things, there's always gonna be weaknesses and gaps that come up. Um, in, in the event of a crisis. Um, we try to keep the plan ever changing. We learn from other people's gaps in their plan and, and made adjustments to ours. Um, we have always done our best to train our employees in the district. We always had, beginning of the school year, we trained new, the new incoming uh, employees, the staff, on the crisis management plan so that everybody was on the same page. Um, we had uh, we had officers on every campus in our district, which is fairly unusual. Um, we, we were very fortunate to have the backing of the school board um, and the superintendent in making sure that we had enough officers to cover um, all of our campuses. We wanted to be very visible. We wanted we wanted officers there right away to be able to respond to whatever would uh, whatever would come up. Uh, we had. 13 full-time officers in our district, and it's a fairly small district, um, but that's what we needed to cover all of our buildings, to cover an afternoon shift as well. 13 full-time officers and five part-time folks that are uh, available to help on, on other uh, events after hours, weekends, whatnot. <clears throat> Part of being very visible 
is being able to build relationships not only with other agencies in the area, which is extremely important, but to build relationships with the staff and students. That, that portion of our job is, is different from a municipality where um, we, we are the, the poster child for community policing, if you will. You know, we're, we're working very closely with the school district personnel, the students, try to uh, build that confidence, build those relationships where everybody's comfortable reporting things to us. Um, we had anonymous reporting systems in place where people could report tips to us. Um, we had the equipment to implement our plan. That was an issue uh, many years ago when the chief first took over the department that we had a plan in place, but we had a gap. We didn't have the equipment that we needed to, to carry out that plan. Um, again, we've had such great support from the board and from the superintendent that uh, we were able to fill that gap. Um, we trained several of our officers last January or February, I believe it was, um, in a craze, in craze training, which is a civilian response to active shooter events. We had, there are four of us that are craze instructors. We started pushing that out to the community um, prior to May 18th, um, and then we've, we've hosted several classes since then. But, um, we had video coverage in all our buildings. We had a, a very good camera system throughout the, throughout the district to be able to monitor um, different events that occur in the different buildings. Body cameras on all the officers. Um, we maintained drills. We drilled with the campuses um, each year. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we do severe weather drills. We do. Uh, a, a lockdown drill for uh, active shooter type situations, fire drills. Um, at the time, we were doing two uh, lockdown active shooter drills per year, one in the fall, one in the spring. Um, and I'll get into some of the changes, but that has changed. Um, we had a reunification plan, <clears throat> excuse me, as part of our, as part of our, our overall crisis plan. As Dr. Wall stated, we, we planned we planned that the, the school staff was going to handle getting the families and the kids back together. What we didn't plan for was the impact that it was going to have on our employees, um, on the staff, to try to, to have to deal with the families for an extended period of time. Um, since then, we've made a lot of significant changes. Uh, we've added five full-time officers to our, uh, to our group. Uh, we added five more part-time officers. We added 10 uh, civilian security people. We have um, a security person that monitors now all our cameras in the district. All day long, one, we have a security person sitting there monitoring the cameras across the district to look for different issues. We have security people that are not only in the buildings, but they're outside patrolling in uh, like a Kawasaki mule to patrol the outside of the building, securing the, uh, the, the uh, physical security of the buildings. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. One of the biggest changes, probably the most visible change that we had made was adding metal detectors to the buildings. Uh, we have them in the high school. Actually, we have them in all the campuses. Um, I think there's nine altogether in the high school alone. Uh, very manpower intensive to run. <clears throat> Sorry. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, threat assessment teams have been established on all the campuses to try to pinpoint kids that are uh, maybe having some issues, some, some kids that need to be uh, monitored more closely. Having these teams in place, we incorporate a police officer, um, counselors, principals, teachers. Um, if need be, we bring in uh, any, uh, any other staff members, bus drivers that may come in contact with these kids that could add some more, uh, could add some more intelligence to you know, what we're trying to gather on the kids. Um, reinstated a program that had been in place for quite a while 
um, that had been kind of underused, but a parents on patrol, kind of citizens on patrol kind of program where the parents were able to come in and, and be another set of eyes and ears in the buildings. Um, before we allow them to come in to take part in that program, we make them go through the craze training and we make them go through a stop the bleed class. Um, that is something that was implemented this year for all the staff as well. Um, all the teachers, any, any employee of the district now before they came to work in the fall um, had to go through that training. Substitute teachers, before they're allowed to sub in any of the classes, they also have to do the craze training and the stop the bleed. Uh, securing the outside of the buildings, we put alarms on all the doors. The doors, are, as most of you will know, a, a school is very difficult to secure. It's, it's kind of a, you got people coming and going out of so many different doors. So it was a big culture change to try to get the staff to limit them to a, a couple of entrances. So we have them, uh, the doors are locked, the doors are alarmed, we get alerts, text messages, and emails, and audible alarms on these doors if the doors are open. Um, that, was, that was really a huge change. It was a big help in limiting the flow of traffic in and out of the building. Um, the other probably biggest change would be the, uh, the secure vestibule at the high school. Um, we are working on the other buildings. The high school was the first one to get done. Um, an expanded vestibule area that's more secure. Uh, you can't just walk in and walk into an office area anymore. Uh, you come in, you have to pass through the metal detectors and, and pass through a screening before you get in the building. Thank, thank you, Chief. Um, uh, Mr. Norman, I know that the role of the board is very important in supporting school safety. And so would you please share what the board had done both prior to May 18th and also after? Um, I have an opportunity to see some questions that are coming in, and I think there might have been a little bit of a misunderstanding, Chief, about your comment related to needing equipment. Um, I think what I heard you say was that you all had the equipment prior to May 18th because the board had had um, supported that. So that might be something that you might want to, to talk about too, Mr. Norman. So I'll just add to okay, that. Okay, sure. Sorry. The, uh, some of the equipment that w we were lacking that was, that was filled in prior to May 18th was um, we, we, were, uh, we were able to purchase patrol rifles. So we had more firepower that were available to the officers. Some breaching tools so that we could uh, be able to enter locked rooms. Um, and, and that was all. Some of the medical equipment that we had, we had all that prior to, to May 18th, um, as, as, long as, and as well as some medical training, first aid stuff. Dr. Walt? Many years prior to May 18th, yeah. Yeah. like yeah. 10 years prior to May 18th. So that, those were... Certainly, certainly they've been enhanced since, but um, I think the, the point was is that our guys were well equipped and we were committed to that as well. Great. Do you want to add anything, Mr. Norman? So, um, <coughs> say from a board perspective, it's on. It didn't sound like it. From a board perspective, prior to the 18th, and we had uh, numerous discussions around safety and security uh, many times, yeah. and. Meantime, these discussions are taking place in executive session. We want to get down to what our plans really look like, and we would bring in uh, our Chief Braun or, or Gary or different folks to talk about lessons learned from audits when they would bring in outside people. And again, this team was being very aggressive, and we were constantly asking the questions, are we meeting all the things that we are required to do when it comes to audits, when it comes to reporting? After May the 18th, we had to go in and ask ourselves essentially what went wrong, did we, did we miss something, was there something that we needed to do differently. After you have a tragic event like the 18th, the students, the staff, the community is concerned and now they're at a, a heightened level of fear and stress 
And then many demands start to be made early on about things that people think they may need to add additional security to make those students and staff feel safe during their educational experience. So we had to start looking at many items to do differently, enhancing what we already had and then what could we add. And as Gary's alluded to, I won't go back and repeat, but there were several things that we said, okay, we need to do this. We've had an incident and we need to do something to reinstill some confidence that we can be a safe school district. We are a safe school district. So I think from a board perspective, we also had to look at being physically responsible. And I'm going to say I'll probably repeat this two or three times, but um, you have to look on one side, you can never put a price on a student's life or safety. But yet, on the other hand, you still have to operate within the means that you're given. So I think that was the biggest challenge for the board while you wanted to do as much as possible that we did have to be physically responsible with taxpayer money and just roughly we spent two million dollars out of fund balance very early on making some of these changes and again being physically responsible we, that cannot continue we cannot just spend money that we don't have down the road to the point, and, and our administration does an excellent job of keeping up with these things, but we even passed a resolution basically saying that if our fund balance got to a certain point, that many expenditures were then going to have to become before the board that don't normally. We've not reached that point, nor do I expect we'll get anywhere close to that point, but it's because the board took the initiative to say our part is to be make sure we're being responsible in all this and relying on the administration and our police department and our staff to tell us what they really need. Thank you. Chief Forward, um, as you know so well, the next part of a management plan is response. And you were one of two police officers who were assigned uh, to Santa Fe High School, so you were on site when this tragedy occurred. When the shots were fired, I know that you and Officer Barnes both ran directly toward the fire. I have seen some very difficult um, footage that tells me that you, uh, because Officer Barnes was a shot as he tried to engage the uh, suspect, um, and I know that you uh, pulled him to safety and saved his life and then you immediately ran back toward the suspect to engage the suspect to save the lives of children. I know you don't want me to do this. Um, you're probably gonna be angry at me <laughs> at the end of this. <laughs> but I would like to have the audience uh, join me in applause for a true hero who showed valor and saved many, many lives. Chief Forward, thank you very much. So, Chief, would you please share with the audience um, what happened on May 18th? <laughs> Still doesn't work. So, as you said, we, I was, Officer Barnes and myself were the two officers that were assigned at the high school. As I said before, we had officers on each campus. We had two us two at the high school, two at the junior high, and one at each of the elementary schools. Strangely enough, May 18th was police week. That was the Friday of police week. And our culinary arts teacher had planned on cooking breakfast for our entire department that morning. Had this happened 30 minutes later, all of our on-duty officers would have been at the high school. So, um, that being said, my office is in the 
the, the education wing of the building, the, where the classrooms are. My office is actually an old classroom. Uh, John's office is in the front office, right at the uh, very front of the building. Because of the way the building is designed, the art rooms are on the, the northwest corner of the building where there's two art rooms, a couple of uh, shop classes, the gym classes are back there in the dance room. There's probably 90 to 95 percent of the school population is on the end of the building where my office is. Um, the first indication that we had of anything that was going on, of anything happening, was a fire alarm. Now, in our in our training, we train the staff to ignore a fire alarm. If you're in a lockdown, to ignore the fire alarm. This was just the opposite. We got the, we got the fire alarm before we had any in, inclination that something was happening. Uh, we weren't in a lockdown situation. People were leaving the building uh, for the fire alarm just like they would any other day. Um, I left my office to come to the front of the building to figure out it was the end of the school year. My initial assumption was kids are running around, somebody pulled the fire alarm, uh, being kids. So I checked the pole stations right near my office. They were intact, so I started making my way to the front of the building to the main office to find out from the fire alarm board where, uh, where the station had been pulled. As I was making my way to the front of the building, I saw John turn from the main hallway and go down the fine arts hallway heading towards the north side of the building. Um, I continued to walk to the office to check the fire alarm panel. Um, as I got near the office, I heard shots. So I immediately ran <clears throat> in the direction where John had gone down the hallway uh, to assist him. I was probably four or five seconds behind him. Um, he got to the end of the hallway and was, was immediately struck uh, by gunfire. And, and then it was a matter of waiting for, you know, I did what I could with John, go back to engage the gunman, try to keep him occupied, distracted, keep him, keep, keep the focus on me, not on the kids. Um, it was several minutes from then until help started arriving. I was uh, very happy to look up and see a trooper and a couple of city cops at that back door um, and having some familiar faces. So um, I know that um, it did not take long for you to uh, respond, that it was only a couple of minutes um, before you all responded. Um, and so the, the plans that had been put in place, the equipment that you had, one thing I'd like you to share that you shared with another group, and that is the importance, and maybe you were going to do this at another time, but if you don't mind sharing the importance of having a tourniquet um, and the fact that you all have uh, not only provided those now for staff, but prior to this event, all of your officers had those. Would you share that? Because I think that's an important lesson learned for everyone. Sure. We have we had the equipment and and we were carrying the tourniquets on our on our belt and I know when the when the chief first pushed those out and said we need to carry them on the belt it was like hey, one more thing on this Batman utility belt that I got to carry around every day and it's cumbersome and, and why well the reason is because of that day so. You know, I talk to cops and city police departments, troopers, sheriff's deputies, and they, they work out of their car. We don't. We don't work out of our car. We work out of an office, and we're not usually in the office. We're out walking the halls of the school, interacting with the staff, interacting with the kids. When this happened, I didn't take the time. I didn't have the time. It wasn't even a, 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 a thought to run to the office to grab anything. So you're gonna use whatever you have on your person. It doesn't do you any good if it's in a desk drawer, if it's in the trunk of your car. Um, you know, I had a, 
I didn't have my bulletproof vest on. <laughs> it's in the car, very safe, secure. <laughs> Nothing's going to happen to it there. Um, but I didn't have it on my person. And again, if I don't have it with me, it's not doing me any good. So I had a ballistic helmet, I had a bulletproof vest, I had a long gun. None of that was on me at the time. So you go to, you go to battle with what you have, not what you wish you had. So um, if I had not had the tourniquet on me, uh, Thank you. I'll finish that yes, one. So, so um, Officer Forward was able to immediately use that tourniquet to to save Officer Barnes. And if, as he said, if the tourniquet, if he had not had that with him, that time that time would have been too long in terms of loss of blood. So, um, so he really is truly a hero. But I think the lesson learned is the importance of the the, the equipment and having it at, at right there on on site. Absolutely. Absolutely. You want to go ahead and add something? I, because of time, I think I'm going to jump a couple of questions that we had. Um, and so, Dr. Wall, one of the things that you talked about was of the importance of collaborative relationships. Um, can you share some examples of those collaborations that worked well, and then maybe we'll have, have others share if, if there are things they want to add? <laughs> Most definitely. So that's one of the things that we kind of talked about at the beginning, and the importance of uh, relationships, and you heard Gary mention it as well. So several entities, it's our law, local law enforcement. He mentioned city. We also had uh, DPS, FBI. Um, uh, many agencies that, that were there to assist in, in, that, in that aspect. We also had many partners, our, just our local school district partners, counselors, bus, bus support, um, public information officers from other schools, other school districts around. Those were important pieces because of the um, enormity um, of the media and the importance of the communication piece that was immediate and ongoing and, and still is ongoing. But, um, the, but then another one that's really important that we did not have as fully extended as we do now is our mental health support partners. And, and um, there are many agencies, our Gulf Coast Center, Red Cross, Region 4, our service education service center that were, with, that were there to assist us with those um, areas, which were critical in that uh, reunification, and then every day since then. So the partnerships, and that's really one of our lessons learned, is the importance of relationships and the importance of partnerships prior to. Um, uh, the reunification center is a great example of that. If we had had all those partnerships developed up front, we would have been able to deploy them when they got to that reunification center. Instead, it was kind of as they came and, and understanding who was who and who was representing who, and who was a credible um, a resource to use for families and um, in that time. So um, the relationship piece is very, very important with all the entities, with local um, agencies, law enforcement agencies, um, statewide law enforcement, and federal law enforcement agencies. Also, federal public information officer support was there, and that was important as well. Um, the public information um, piece and the communication piece was, was a huge piece that our staff, although it was planned for, was um, way overwhelming and, and certainly not prepared for, for the enormity of, of that event. So the importance of the collaborative relationships and the relationships to establish beforehand and, and even agreements with entities that are, that are as appropriate and then ongoing. I know many of those relationships are, are, we had certainly with the Region Center beforehand and are certainly ongoing. Same thing with some of our local mental health pieces. Ongoing is, is important as well. Mr. Norman? So uh, let me add, um, you can have all the policies, all the procedures you can drill, you can be as good as you think you can be, but one of the things that you're never prepared for is the aftermath of an actual event. And Dr. Wall and Pam had alluded to earlier uh, some of the things around mental health, and Gary alluded to some of the folks not really taking into account what the, the, the human factor would be afterwards. But another thing that was extremely overwhelming, and it happened very early on, was the outpouring of support and resources. Now, many things were coming from the FBI, the ATF, 
the Texas Rangers, the Texas Department of Public Safety. You just go right on down the list. And so when you start setting up your crisis management plan and then you're dealing with these folks who you've never met before, in many cases, you're not real sure who's in charge here. Who's actually, is the FBI telling me that this is what we are going to do, or are they asking me? And, and to be honest with you, they were asking. But it, it took a little while to, to understand that, because we really didn't have and never thought about some of those relationships, because again, you never really think about the aftermath of an actual event. And so you have very well-meaning folks in a lot of cases that come and want to offer help and support. And it's difficult sometimes in the heat of the moment to sort of uh, manage what's, what's real here and, and what's, what's just well-meaning and what do I really need. And I think establishing some of those relationships ahead of time will make a lot of difference if you ever have any type of incident. And I want to add one more piece to that. We're obviously talking school safety and security, but everyone's focus right now is towards active shooter intruder type things. A lot of these things apply for other type tragedies as well. It could be weather related. It could be a bus accident with students. It could be any one of a number of things. So you really need to be taking all this serious and establishing those relationships works for a wide variety of things, not just an active shooter intruder. Thank you. We have just a few more minutes for us to talk before we um, ask for questions. And I think uh, you have all alluded to the fact that communication, uh, both before, during, and after um, any kind of an event are critically important. So Dr. Wall, would you uh, start us off by talking about what worked and what didn't work with your communication plan. Sure. So we definitely have a communication plan, and we had a plan to have our center located off-site, like, like we mentioned. Um, however, we, we had not the forethought to know whether or not we would do press releases. We were operating under under the um, communication plan for which we have communicated as a district in, in many events, which is our system, our call-out system, our email system, our uh, notifications to families, and we did that initially, and we maintained a log of that, but then it became um, a bit larger than that, and we ended up with uh, determining to do press conferences because it was... Um, it was just a very big and massive undertaking to try to keep up with the communications. We had lots of support, lots of help from um, public information officers from across the state, really, helping to, uh, to navigate some of those pieces, some of the tools that we use. So we initially determined press conferences for the first three days would be the way that we would communicate with, um, with, with our community and then with others. Um, and then after that, we began our personal communications to our community um, only, and, and then um, using our website, the media to the extent that we could control. I will say one thing that, that what became glaringly obvious was that it was, uh, it was uncontrollable. Information, misinformation, still misinformation that's communicated, and, and um, we are not, we have not, will not, and have not been able to share some specific information intentionally, and as it's an ongoing and, um, trial, and we don't want to, to jeopardize anything that would uh, jeopardize the outcome of that. So we have not been able to share some information that we have and then some that we don't have. Mr. Norman mentioned the FBI, and we initially, one of the first things that we did was turn over the investigation to the FBI. In doing that, it took it out, out of our hands. And then some of the information today we still don't have. We will, we will learn it as, as you all do as well. But even even if we did, and some of the things that we do know, we're not able to share. That's frustrating to people, and it's kind of frustrating to us as well. We want to be transparent. We want to communicate, and that's been our goal all along um, to this day. However, you know, the restrictions and, and some of the um, pieces of misinformation that we cannot um, cannot correct is, is, is difficult. 
It's difficult for us and difficult for community to, to understand. So communication plan, we, ha we had the tools in place, websites, we set up a portal to answer questions, we set up press conferences, we continued to keep contact logs so that we were communicating many times with our, um, with our community. However, it was not enough. You know, it's one of those, it's kind of like the safety piece. We couldn't do enough to keep up with, with uh, the demand and what, what's going on. So that's still an ongoing challenge. Uh, I think communication and being able to, uh, to regain some of that trust that, that was broken that day is something that we will we'll continue to be challenged with and, and hopefully communication's a way to help, help build, build that bridge. So communication's huge and we all know that and, and it's one of those we have tried since day one to stay, to stay with it, but, but it's a challenge. Did you want to add something, Mr. Norman? Well, obviously, after you have an event of that magnitude, people want answers, and they want to hear things. And you, you get caught up sometimes in the, the sympathy and the respect and the healing process that needs to start taking place with those that were the most impacted. And then trying to avoid false information, and as Dr. Wall alluded to, a lot of information you couldn't discuss anyway, but people still wanted to know things. And again, as she mentioned, we did some press conferences early on, but, but people wanted more. And I think it, it was frustrating for us in many cases, we didn't have the answers. We did not want to knee jerk and just go put out some edicts and buy a little equipment and say, okay, we're done. We wanted to try to be as transparent as possible, and part of that is also being willing to accept input from the community, from teachers, from students, from, all, from everyone, and that takes time. And when you have an event of that magnitude, sometimes people don't really want to give you time. So it's very frustrating, but... All in all, I'm, I'm not sure that we would change a whole lot because we just did not want to give out false information. Were there things that we maybe could have communicated better? I, I think sometimes we should have probably just gone out, called a meeting, and told the community, we don't have anything to say. We don't have anything we can tell you. We didn't do that, and in hindsight, maybe we should have. But it's very frustrating for a while until you start getting some answers meaning what are you going to do differently? What, what things are happening over the summer, for instance, before my kid comes back to school in August and those type things. Uh, we communicated them as fast as we could, but we did not want to put out false information that would lead people and give them a, a false sense of security that may or may not be there. Thank you. We're going to go to questions now from the audience. We have a few that have already been posted, but if anyone wants to uh, ask a question, uh, uh, you certainly can go to the mic. One of the things that we were going to be talking about but ran out of time actually was one of the most uh, significant or are the questions that m the most people were interested in hearing, and that relates to mental health. And of course, the, there are huge challenges after an event like that, not only for students, but for staff in the community. So the question was, what impact have the security measures had on students and their mental health? Do students feel safer um, or, or is the opposite occurring? So mental health has been a, I'll start and then let you guys add to it if you'd like. Um, a mental health is, is an important, uh, important integrated piece of all of the recovery of this, of this tragedy. And it's, it's been from day one part of the important part. We've added, we've added mental health support and many, many, many layers of that. We have extra counselors. We have the ability for um, students to access a resiliency center in our, um, in our city that we work in conjunction with. And that allows for families to get additional support. So that's, that's, that's a huge piece of the recovery that unfortunately we didn't talk a whole lot about, but, um, but it is ongoing and it is critical and it is important and it is an area that we would like to continue to enhance as a preventative as much as recovery. And, and it's an area that we did not have a strong, strong of a hold on before, um, before May 18th. We had counselors, but our counselors were um, focused 
primarily on academic counseling. Well, of course, handling at-risk students and, and needs as they came up, but it wasn't a comprehensive mental health wellness plan that we will certainly have in place going forward to support students and families um, beforehand in any, in any instance, it, in, whether it's behavioral or academic. So how students feel about the safety and security measures is an interesting question, and I think the jury's still out on that for them and for us. We have, we have um, we put out surveys, and, and we will do that again at the end of the year from parents and for students. Students and parents feel differently about it, I think. At, at least they did up front, and I think they do even more now. Um, I, I have actually a group of students that I visit with, and, and it's an advisory capacity, and I actually asked them that uh, yesterday. And, um, and, and I will tell you, as far as um, most of the things that we have put in place, they, they do feel like it's, it's helped make them feel safer. Metal detectors are, are still questionable for them because, um, because they're inconvenient. Some of them do feel like they're, um, they're, they, they, they make them feel safer. Some of them feel like it's more of a um, um, restrictive jail type setting that's not um, not conducive to a positive learning environment. So there's that um, balance between the need for extremely high uh, safety measures and a positive culture and environment for education. And so that's really what we're balancing. And when we initially, after the event, when, and, when, and Rusty mentioned this as well, we had to put extra safety measures in place. We had to, to beef it up a whole lot. And that's what everybody needed. That's what our staff needed. That's what we needed to do. And that's what our students and families needed. I think as, um, as we put all of those things in place, we will begin to assess and see how they feel about them and see if, it's, um, if there are areas that we want to continue to beef up or areas that we want to um, um, minimize in different ways. And so I think the jury's still out on how kids feel about it. I think it's mixed, and, and I think it's also too soon to make that decision. Time has to, um, has to, to go by a little bit for us to really assess and see which things are important for us to maintain and sustain for longer periods of time and which things are not. Mr. So I, I think, let me just add a little piece of that. If you look at your, the policies and procedures that most districts have in place, a lot of it is actually responding to something that's gone wrong or, you know, you're testing your facilities. Can someone get in from the outside or the doors locked or students open the doors for them and those type things, but they're sort of reactionary once you've had a problem. The mental health piece by and large, is what I think you're going to be looking for in the future to try to be more predictive of problems because you can harden schools to the point to where they do look like a prison trying to keep intruders out. But in most of these school shootings, the person that the perpetrator was supposed to be there and, and knew what was going on and knew your facility. So I think that's where the mental health, emotional stability, uh, you know, social media monitoring, all those things, I think, clearly are going to come in to play for the longer term. Thank you. You really have answered another question that um, had been asked. So, but I want to, um, I want to have you uh, elaborate a little bit more on the mental health issue, because there's a question that asks, um, you know, what, what should a district or campus plan include to be effective in preventing a reoccurrence. So maybe you can share some ideas. I can touch on, on, on that a little bit. And um, one of the areas that we added that's, I think, an another key to it is those threat assessment teams. We used the Secret Service model in doing that. And um, Gary talked a little bit about that in uh, one of the layers that we've added in, in regards to mm -hmm. mental health support and to be able to identify and connect behaviors as kids go through the system and and also brings in multiple pieces so you have law enforcement you have counselors you have teachers and you have other um, staff who interact with those children as they go through the system and can identify events that happen and then connect them and and seek um, support as needed and so the intent for that is to be able to be more of a mitigation and a, a prevention 
in, in that regard. So I think that will be a bit, uh, uh, at least we put in place this year and seems to be a good start in that regard. Also, um, including the, the additional counseling support. I think in our schools, and I'm, I'm gonna assume in, in others as well, we, everybody has counselors, but those counselors have, have their, their positions haven't been as focused on that mental health support in schools and wellness support in schools as much as maybe we feel like it should, at least for us now, definitely but then possibly for others going forward as well. I think our, I think many people will tell you, and I know we say this all the time, our, our world has changed for our children, and the fact that kids have to face the fact that there are school shootings and staff has to face that is the reality that for which we all have to understand that, that that's, a, that's a piece that we have to address. The mental health components, the counseling components, suicide prevention, trauma, um, trauma, Training, trauma-specific training for um, staff and for and for families and students as well. So, I think the mental health component has as many layers that we can add as does the hardening and safety component. I think that we are beginning we are beginning to add those components. I also think our state, with the governor's plan and some of the bills that are uh, um, in the works, are also supportive of that. Okay. I would agree with her wholeheartedly and I had the opportunity week before last to attend the TASB function where there was a the Texas Association of Student Councils had some students there, student council members from across the state and they overwhelmingly mentioned the fact that they liked having the thought of a counselor that wasn't just a person that was going to tell them to take English or math but someone that knew a little bit about the pressures that they were facing and, and the social media and the peer pressure and things like that. Um, that message was loud and clear from a lot of those students that counseling will be important to them. We've touched in Santa Fe uh, heavily early on in grief counseling, but then that will carry on to the next level of these kids and the counseling they need to deal with today's problems. To, to elaborate a little bit on that, one of the questions has to do with um, what kind of changes or programs or plans have you made to impact school climate? Um, I would think they're meaning in addition to the threat assessments, just what you're doing to uh, create a, a, a positive climate in your schools. So culture is important. Positive climate is important. We have to um, make, make our schools and make our students safe and in a good place to learn, and that's really why they're there. So um, those are really two big reasons. They have to be safe and they have to be ready to learn. And so um, there are many, I think, pieces that, that fit into that as well. One, one that comes to mind is um, comprehensive, so positive behavior support, and that's so character ed programs behavior support programs where you identify and, and provide interventions and support for students and families who, who have um, areas for which they're not successful, whether it's behavioral or academic. So those types of, I think, programs that are comprehensive, and I say comprehensive meaning system. So from our entire system, from pre-K through uh, seniors, that there's an understanding of values, beliefs, behaviors, the way that we treat people, the way that we want to be treated. Generally, if you go to our high school right now, you'll see um, what the kids have put out on, on the parking lot that says kindness matters. And that sort of sums it up. We have to get back to how we treat people and caring for people and paying attention to those things as well. So I think we have time for maybe one more question before we end. Um, a question is, um, have students had a voice in changes made to school safety after the event? <laughs> I'll start and then you can add into that. So, yes and no. So initially, no. Uh, our initial response from the minute that, um, that the event happened and we started planning for the, for the upcoming year, changes to the building that were necessary, changes to safety that were demanded from the community and because that, that was, because um, the event happened. 
Um, we, we, in terms of community support, we had a safety and security committee that involved many um, community members, law enforcement agencies, our staff. We had teachers, we had counselors, we had administrators, we had parents. All of those people on that committee that really came together. Students really were not included in that committee. And certainly going forward is a, a great idea and certainly student voice is important. And so that is something that throughout the year we've created focus groups for our students to be able to share their thoughts and feelings in going forward. So we responded initially um, with the demand from parents and, and part of that demand was we're the parents we know it's best for our kids. Um, I, however, I think moving forward, we certainly want to include student voice in how we sustain what we've put in place and what's important to them. They have identified the importance of our uh, security personnel, our police officers. Um, Gary mentioned relationships with police officers. That is huge and that is key. If we can put security folks in our buildings with kids in the, cla in the classrooms, in the hallways, in the cafeterias, in the gyms, in and out all day long where kids feel comfortable talking to them, that's how you prevent things. The minute we, we can know about it sooner than anybody else, that's how you know, and kids know about it before we do. And if they can talk to, comfortably talk to um, the guys who can, who can make a difference and, and find out what's going on, and all of our teachers included in that, then, then we're gonna have a better shot at, at warding off things that shouldn't be happening. So um, definitely student voice is involved, should be involved, has been as we started the year and will be as we move forward. Initially was not so much. Well, unfortunately, um, we have run out of time, but I think you can see that the school district of Santa Fe ISD, the community of Santa Fe, is very fortunate to have leaders like these, and they represent many, many others. So please join me in thanking them for sharing their lessons learned. Thanks for having us.